And our reading this afternoon is going to be from what we call the Canons of Dort and the Belgic Confession. The afternoon worship service, for those of you who may be listening online or who are new to us, is a service in which we teach. We look through the truth that the Word of God teaches us. And in this church, we have three what we call confessions. And these are summaries of the overall teaching of Scripture. And there are three confessions. They are rooted in Scripture. They only teach what Scripture teaches. And uh, they help us understand the Bible. And uh, we're going to look at the Canons of Dort and the Belgian Confession, which are two of those confessional summaries that we have from Scripture. First of all, Canons of Dort, page 579 of your Book of Praise. If you have one in, in front of you, if you don't, it's at the back of the church. You can find one there. And we'll first of all read from chapter 3, 4, article 17. And this is about the use of means in how the Holy Spirit builds faith in us. We'll read Article 17 together. The almighty working of God, whereby he brings forth and sustains this our natural life, does not exclude, but requires the use of means, by which he, according to his infinite wisdom and goodness, has willed to exercise his power. So also the aforementioned supernatural working of God, whereby he regenerates us, in no way excludes or cancels the use of the gospel, which the most wise God has ordained to be the seed of regeneration and the food of the soul. For this reason, the apostles and the teachers who succeeded them reverently instructed the people concerning this grace of God to his glory and to the abasement of all pride. In the meantime, however, they did not neglect to keep them by the holy admonitions of the gospel under the administration of the word, the sacraments, and discipline. That's church discipline. So today, those who give or receive instruction in the church should not dare to tempt God by separating what he in his good pleasure has willed to be closely joined together. For grace is conferred through admonitions, and the more readily we do our duty, the more this favor of God who works in us usually manifests itself in its luster, and so his work best proceeds. To God alone, both for the means and for their saving fruit and efficacy, all glory is due throughout eternity. Amen. Now that's a lot to digest, but let's go to the next chapter 5, article 14, where this is summarized in a bit simpler form. That's page 585 of your book of praise. Article 14, which says the use of means in perseverance. Perseverance is how God promises to preserve our faith until we die. God uses means in perseverance. Let's see. Just as it has pleased God to begin this work of grace, salvation, in us by the preaching of the gospel, so he maintains, continues, and perfects it by the hearing and reading of his word, by meditation on it, by its exhortations, threats, and promises, and by the use of the sacraments. So God uses means to build faith. Now, last one, a Belgian Confession, Article 33, page 513 of your Book of Praise. This is about the sacraments. God uses baptism and the Lord's Supper to strengthen our faith. How does he do so? Article 33. We believe that our gracious God, mindful of our insensitivity and weakness, notice that? God is mindful of our weakness, so what does he do? He has ordained sacraments to seal his promises to us and to be pledges of his goodwill and grace towards us. He did so to nourish and sustain our faith. He has added these to the word of the gospel to represent better to our external senses both what he declares to us in his word and what he does inwardly in our hearts. Thus he confirms to us the salvation which he imparts to us. Sacraments are visible signs and seals of something internal and invisible by means of which God works in us through the power of the Holy Spirit. Therefore the signs are not void and meaningless so that they deceive us, for Jesus Christ is their truth. 
Apart from him, they would be nothing. Moreover, we are satisfied with the number of sacraments which Christ our Master has instituted for us, namely two, the sacrament of baptism and the Holy Supper of Jesus Christ. And one more we're going to read now from the Heidelberg Catechism, our third confessional statement. This time we'll read Lord's Day 25. If you open your book of phrase to page 539, you'll see Lord's Day 25 there. You'll also see all the scripture references underneath. These confessions arise straight out of scripture. And if they're wrong, and we can show that they're wrong, then through Scripture, we would change them. So just to be clear on that. Lord's Day 25. Since then, faith alone makes us share in Christ and all his benefits. Where does this faith come from? From the Holy Spirit, who works it in our hearts by the preaching of the gospel and strengthens it by the use of the sacraments. What are the sacraments? The sacraments are holy, visible signs and seals. They were instituted by God so that by their use he might the more fully declare and seal to us the promise of the gospel. And this is the promise, that God graciously grants us the forgiveness of sins and everlasting life because of the one sacrifice of Christ accomplished on the cross. Are both the word and the sacraments then intended to focus our faith on the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross as the only ground of our salvation? Yes, indeed. The Holy Spirit teaches us in the gospel and assures us by the sacraments that our entire salvation rests on Christ's one sacrifice for us on the cross. How many sacraments has Christ instituted in the new covenant? Two, holy baptism and the holy supper. As far we have reading on faith and the sacraments in the word. Now, creation of Christ for the last two weeks We've had sermons in the afternoon on the gospel. And to use theological terms, we define the gospel as justification by faith alone, or, or what some would say, substitutionary atonement. Big words. Let me summarize it in simpler form. The point is, the gospel teaches us in the Bible that all of us are completely sinful and dead in our sin. Ever since Adam and Eve sinned and Eight of the fruit. Because God is perfectly righteous and just, he must punish us with eternal wrath for the sin that we have and the disobedience we have. But the good news of Jesus Christ is that God sends the Son of God himself, one of the three of the Trinity, down to earth to become a human and God at the same time, and he dies to pay the wrath that we deserve. He's our substitute and he atones for our sin. Then, Jesus offers his sacrifice to all of us and we can gain what he gained, which is the propitiation the, that he paid the wrath we deserve for us and he gives that gift to us by grace. And now we can be righteous just like Jesus is. We can stand before God. We can have perfect relationship with him he can now love us because he now no longer has to punish us because he sees Jesus when he looks at us. As Jesus covers us with his sacrifice. Now, in order to believe that that is true for you, you all you have to do is believe. The good news is that if you believe that Jesus actually died for you, and gave you his atonement as a substitute, you can have eternal life with Jesus. But you have to believe that he actually did it. Now, because we're sinful and human and are, we're dead spiritually, the Bible's teaching, Romans 3, we are not even able to muster up the faith to believe that Jesus died for us in our sinful nature. Our minds are darkened, our hearts are rebellious, our wills are corrupted. And so we can't even muster up enough faith to believe that Jesus died. And so the question is, where does faith come from? 
I mean, we struggle, right? How many times have I heard someone say to me, oh, if only I could have seen the resurrected Jesus, then I would believe. How can I be sure that the gospel's real, that the, the, the generous offer is true? And our struggle with faith is a little bit even worse than that. Faith has two kind of layers, I would say. There is what we would call saving faith, the faith to believe that Jesus died for me, period. But faith, that's the beginning of faith. There's also another layer to faith, and that's that a lot of Christians, they believe that Jesus saved them, but now they need to learn to trust Jesus as their Lord with their whole life. And we struggle with that too. I mean, lots of us, you know, Christians, we come to the point where we believe in Jesus. We go, oh, yes, Jesus has saved me. And then we go home and we worry about our money. Or maybe our children are struggling in school. And yes, I believe in Jesus. I believed he saved me. But then our children are, are struggling in school and we lose our minds and panic and all. Oh, and God's far from us and we have no trust. Faith is a big deal, not only for belief, but for living a healthy, productive life under Jesus' lordship. And so there's two layers. Now, I want to keep these two layers in mind because they help explain this sermon. Faith is fundamental not to salvation and all of life. And if there's an area of my life where there's no faith, that is a sinful area of my life where there is no God in which I am an atheist. Sin has dominion in that part of my life. And there's no benefits of Christ in that area. So faith is critical for the Christian to believe and also to live a good life. Okay, now, how has faith worked? That's the answer. Question and answer 65 of Lord's Day 25 asks the question, since then faith alone makes us share in Christ and all his benefits, where does this faith come from? Oh, man, we really need faith. So where do we get it? Three answers. Actually, kind of four. But the two of the answers work with the other two. Here's answer number one. Faith comes from the Holy Spirit. The teaching of the Bible in Romans chapter 3 and 4. But you can see quoted... It's not quoted on this one. Yeah, it's quoted in... Question answer 66, Romans 4, 11. The teaching of Scripture is that we are too dead in our sin to even conjure up or create faith on our own. Romans 3 especially makes this point. We're all dead in our sin. Faith has to come from the outside. Now here's a quote. Here's Galatians 5, verse 5. For through the Spirit... We eagerly await by faith the righteousness for which we hope. Okay? It's very clear in Scripture. That without the Holy Spirit, there's no faith. Human beings cannot believe without power from God, without being regenerated in the human soul. Okay? Now, the next question is, how does the Holy Spirit work faith in my heart? Am I completely passive in the process of faith being worked in my heart? You know, lots of Christians fall into this. They think that, well, the Holy Spirit either gives me faith or he doesn't, so I guess I have no role. I guess I'm supposed to just be passive and wait for the Holy Spirit to do it. Hopefully people pray for me because that would help. Is that how we work with our faith through the Holy Spirit? No. We read from the Canons of Dort, we read from the Belgian Confession, and we read from the Heidelberg Catechism, and you can read in Scripture that the teaching of Scripture is that faith is worked through means. Look at, where does faith come from? The Holy Spirit who works it in our hearts by the preaching of the gospel. God uses the preaching of Christ he uses the Bible, the Word, to work faith, to awaken our hearts, to re renew our minds. It's Romans 12, verse 1 and 2. To renew our minds. Let's 
We are not passive participants in the journey of faith. Now, in a sense, it's true. If I look at my neighbors and my neighborhood, I want them all to be saved. The problem is, no matter how often I tell them about the gospel, they still don't believe. They're either given faith or they're not. So that's true. However, when it comes to Christians who already believe, it's different. Because Christians can grow in their faith if they participate more in the means rather than less. The great church father Chrysostom commented on this in a sermon on Philippians. Here's what he says. Paul speaks of the gift of faith as if it were already granted. Listen. The faith is not given unilaterally from God, but in a way that we can take a share in it. Even here, the greater part of the share comes from God. But this gift is not given in such a way as to circumvent or overcome free will. Rather, it is given to make us humble and rightly disposed. So the gift is given in a way to awaken us and have us participate on the journey, even though all the power comes from God. Point being... If you participate in the means available to you, the word and the sacraments, your faith will grow. If you don't, your faith will grow slower or not at all. Now, what are the means? There's two means. The first is the word or the preaching. Now, the Canons of Dort, which we read earlier, talks about how the word of God changes us. Right? Just as God began the work of grace by the preaching of the gospel, so that's how people are initiated into the, the faith. You come to faith by hearing about Christ preached. I've seen this firsthand. person was not a Christian. Gospel was preached. They were completely shaken up and transformed. And now they are a Christian. When God wants someone to become a Christian, he brings the gospel to their lives so that they hear about Jesus and then they change. That is the way. Now, God also uses the gospel to continue our growth in faith. Look what he says. So he maintains, continues, and perfects faith by the hearing and reading of his word, by meditation on it, by its exhortations, its uh, um, encouragements, its threats and promises. So we grow quicker when we hear more preaching, when we engage more in the word. And it's interesting that he, these words that are used, maintains, he perfects it. He brings our faith to completion, to the, what, it, what it most should be. And he does it through meditation. Interesting word, isn't it? You know, lots of people, they, they want things to come easy, right? We want everything to just make sense to us instantaneously. But this word meditation conveys the idea that I have to not only read the word and hear it, but I have to think about it and process it deeply over and over and over again before it really begins to sink, sink home. And it takes time and energy to do that. And then it also says the exhortations, threats, and promises. So sometimes in preaching, you have to say hard things. You have to bring the hard truths of the gospel that punishment for not believing is really high. Or that if you're failing to obey, there's going to be consequences and you're not going to like them. There's all sorts of these things in the Word too. And these things help bring the Word home. But then there's the promises. The promise, if you have faith, then good things will, you know, these are the means God uses. Now there's, I think some of us, we are going to have objections. So many of us, we want to pretend that there are other means by which I can grow my faith. You know, I can grow my faith if I walk in the woods. Now, it's probably a good thing to do, but the Bible nowhere suggests that spending time in nature itself is a faith builder. It can, it can, it can sort of help in a way, but it's not really the, the thing that does it. No, you got to be in the Word. Now, some of you are going to say, oh, but I struggle to understand the Bible. It's so big. It's so complicated. I would simply say in response that two things. There are countless resources available to help us understand the word. The fact that it's hard to understand is not, an, is not in some way an excuse 
for my failure to engage with it. That's number one. I mean, there are as many resources in the Bible for studying the Word or in the, on the internet or whatever. There's like sand at the seashore. There's so many resources. That library over there is full of them. You've got stacks of them there. They're not really well used, by the way. You can go find them. You can take them home. You can use them. Secondly, the Bible's hard to understand. You can find people to help you. There's worlds of good preaching online. You know, there's preaching here in this church. I have been trained to teach you the Bible. There are lots of men like me. Engage with that. Let, let people teach you. And finally, God never promised that engaging with the Word would be easy. It's not fast food. It's not designed for convenience. The Word is designed to disrupt your life and to radically change your thinking. That's hard. If you're going to have the Word be present in your life, you're going to have to deeply inconvenience yourself and assign time to it that you would rather spend on Netflix. Here's a, and here, an exhortation or, or a, a threat. <laughs> as the, if you spend your 20s and your 30s doing anything but studying the Word, your 40s and your 50s are not going to be great. Do not waste your time on useless amusements. You will pay for it as life goes on. It is a fact of life. Now, some of us have had a late start. That's, that's understandable. But get into the Word, and the sooner the better. The sooner your life will change. Because the Word shows you Jesus, and He is the one who, who heals and changes your life. Anytime you think you have Jesus, but you're not willing to engage in the Word, what are you doing? You're, you're having Jesus on your own terms. You probably have a Jesus that has no relation to the one in the Bible. It's interesting, in 2 Peter 3, verse 6, he says to his uh, readers something interesting. He says, he's talking about the Apostle Paul's letters to the churches. And he says, his letters contain some things that are hard to understand. Oh, even Peter is like, yeah, you know, Paul's letters, they're kind of hard to understand sometimes. But so what? And he says, ignorant and unstable people distort as they do the other scriptures to their own destruction. Don't be one of those people. Now, other, other, here's another objection. Some people would say, well, look, why do we have to so intensely study the word? Isn't the word really the, just a simple message about Jesus? Once I get the message, shouldn't, isn't that enough? Shouldn't I let other Christians deal with the finer, deeper points? After all, theologians, it's their job to know the deeper things. My job is just to know the basics. You know, a lot of Christians say, it's my, my place to major in the minors. Here's a few answers to that objection. First, 2 Timothy 3, verse 15 says this, All Scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. That is a promise. If you engage with Scripture, it's God-breathed and it will do things to you. If you don't engage with it, you don't get to enjoy the promise. And one of the things that's being implied by 2 Timothy 3 is that there's this effect that the Word has when it saturates us. People who think that they can have a tenuous, long, distant relationship with Scripture, they forget how sinful and darkened their minds really are. Your thoughts are foolish. And if you let your thoughts define your reality, you will be a fool. Scripture is the truth of God. It attacks the folly, and it is the way the folly is pushed out so that God's thoughts, right? That's what it says. God breathed, replace the, the foolish thoughts. Romans 12, verse 2. Do not be conformed to the pattern of this world. That's who we are but in our natural state. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind. What is it that renews your mind? Well, God's thoughts have to enter it on a constant and regular basis. 
Saturation is the goal. The disciples that desaturate their mind with Scripture sooner grow quickest. Always. The people that grow slowest have the most tenuous relationship with Scripture. Fact. Iron law. Now third, there's another passage I want to read with you. Isaiah 55, verse 10 through 11. Here's a passage. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven, hear that? Just as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there, but water the earth. So rain comes down, it stays on earth, and it produces something, right? It making the earth bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater. This is the effect that rain has, especially on a desert land like Israel. I remember once seeing a a documentary about the Australian desert and how when it rains, it's rained so infrequently there that when it does rain, the whole desert blooms. Because all these plants are lying dormant, waiting for the once in five year rain. This is the image in our minds. And when the rain comes down, it just something has to happen because these seeds, these plants are so thirsty for it. So that's the image. Now, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that for which I purpose. It shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. Oh, think about the power in that. The word goes and it has to have an effect. It will change the person who is listening to it. Maybe it could be that it drives the person away from God or push it brings them closer. It's one of the two. The question you have to ask yourself is when the, the word falls on my soil, am I, is it pushing me away from God or is it pushing me towards God? Which is, which is happening? Repentance will determine which. Now, let me give you an example. One of my habits that I've developed, which I didn't used to have, but it's developed in recent years, is to translate a psalm from the Old Testament every day from the Hebrew. Now, it's an, it's, it's an interesting habit because some days I finish translating the psalm and I go, okay, doesn't seem to have an effect on me. Okay, you know, it's interesting. But because I've learned to do it on a regular basis, and it takes an half an hour to an hour a day or whatever, however, 20 minutes or whatever it is, now that I'm at like Psalm 30 and I've been doing this for a long time, I've begun to notice that, that the thinking of the Psalms is entering my life more than I expected. One big way is in conflict. How can someone live in conflict and maintain righteousness and be encouraged? One of the things that David constantly emphasizes in the Psalms is two things. One is, do not let me be put to shame, by which he means, don't let me be sinful. Don't, don't protect me from my own sin in the conflicts I have with my enemy. Don't let, Psalm 25, don't let my enemies rejoice because of my sin. And the point he's making is when you're in a conflict, you first start by examining your own motives. And you be devastatingly honest, am I contributing to this or not? And then David also says, number two, he says, vindicate me. And what he means is, don't fight for yourself. Let the Lord solve what's happening. Let him deal with it. The Lord will show that you meant to do the right thing. And all, see, it's all from the Psalms. And sometimes I find these thoughts coming out, and I never even knew I had them. This constant exposure to the Psalms has done this in some way I can't understand. Just one example. The Holy Spirit uses the word even when we don't think he is. The word has enormous power. And to not engage with it, it's sort of like, you know, going to the hospital and you have some sort of serious infectious disease and then the, 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 the hospital offers you a life-saving drug and then you're like, oh, I don't feel, don't feel like I, I'd rather not take it. You would rather continue to have your dangerous hepatitis C infectious disease 
That's what you're doing when you don't engage with the word and let it clean your mind and make you pure. Don't do it. The word, oh, it's so beautiful once you see how much power it has in your life. Anyway, now, second, the sacraments. Scotism says that the sacraments strengthen faith. Now, it's interesting that the Spirit works faith through the Word. Hear the difference? And strengthens it with the sacraments. The sacraments are not the primary way, the sort of main building of faith. They strengthen what the Word is doing. Very important. Now, we should not underestimate the sacraments of baptism and Lord's Supper. Just because it says that they strengthen only, that doesn't mean we underestimate them. No, they're very powerful. Why are the sacraments powerful? Why do we need them? Listen, baptism and Lord's Supper are pictures of the gospel. They illustrate what the word teaches. It's kind of like a children's picture book. The children's picture book knows, the writers of those books know that children struggle with text-heavy books. They struggle to produce abstract reasoning. And so the writer of a children's book, he has an illustration beside the word. That's what a sacrament ultimately does. And, and a bit more, and I'll get to that. They were instituted by God so that by their use, what? He might full, more fully declare and seal to us the promise of the gospel. They're a sign that speaks to a higher reality, both the reality that's happening in us and the reality that's happening um, in heaven. It's like a road sign, right? A road sign says, do not speed, 100 kilometers an hour. Well, the sign isn't the reality. You driving 100 kilometers an hour is the reality. The sign simply speaks to the reality. Okay? The key thing about the reality is that they're speaking about Christ. And God does it because we're insensitive and weak. That's what the Belgian Confession says. We need these tangible things to reinforce what the Word says. And it's serious. You know, in Corinth, when certain members of the church were misusing the Lord's table, they fell asleep. They died. So in that sense, the sacrament is a seal. They have a real spiritual power when used appropriately. Romans 4, verse 11, Abraham's circumcision there is said to be a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith in his heart. This is baptism is a seal. When someone is baptized, it's like, a, like a, the ring, you know, and the, the red wax, and the ring goes into the wax, and it, now it's an official document. The document before the seal was not official. After the seal, it is official. It's stamped with the approval of the, the governing authority of the land. And so when someone is baptized in this church, God, and it's, we pray over it and we do so in the authority of the Lord. That baptism is like a seal. God goes, boom, this person belongs to me. And it's official. And that's powerful. If you have a legal document and it is not notarized, the document has no power. That's what being an unbaptized person is like. And there's another layer to this. I've explained this before. Lots of Christians in North America, especially, and I think anywhere, they think that they self-attest to their faith. So if I ask someone on the street, and they, we have the impression that we think we determine whether I'm a Christian or not. I ask someone on the street, and are you a Christian? They go, yes, I'm a Christian. Now, the question I always want to ask, but I, I don't usually because I don't want to be cruel, is really, did anybody confirm that? Are you the only person who attests to whether you have true faith? It's, of course, very rude to ask that question, but if you're the only person who can testify to whether you have faith, you are in big trouble. Here in the church, we offer you something. We offer you the ability to seal your faith. That means you can come before the elders. I'm a Christian. And the elders ask you a series of questions to ensure that your faith is actually biblical. And after the meeting, we say, 
Yes, you can become a member of the church because we have evaluated your faith and it's real. And now you can be baptized here as a sign and a seal of this thing that we've attested. Now you can come before this church, you can profess your faith, and we, are, we stand behind you when you do that, saying, yes, this person's profession is real. And the sacraments are a big part of that. That's why in this church we only admit people to the Lord's table whom we've evaluated their faith. So the table means something. You are not the only judge of whether you believe. Now let's finish with question answer 67. Are both the word and the sacraments then intended to focus our faith on the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross as the only ground of our salvation? You see, this is what the picture of the sacraments and the word is supposed to be. Everything is saying Jesus is the only way. Jesus is everything. In Christ, by making him large, my faith can grow. Everything is about him. That's what all of it is trying to say. The problem with us Christians is we constantly forget that and we need to be reminded by the word constantly. But it's all about him. It's not about, we don't need to spend a lot of time in church, in essence, talking about these things apart from Christ. No, they all direct to him. In essence, this is the true means of grace in the end that everything talks about Jesus. Wherever people talk about Jesus, that's the means by which the Holy Spirit grows faith in us. How do we talk about Jesus? We open the word and we use the sacraments. And so that is what it is all about. So participate in the means, brothers and sisters. Go to the place where Jesus is preached. Take part in the Lord's Supper. Be baptized. Enjoy these things. Use them to the fullest so that your faith may be robust. Amen. Now let's pray.